five winter murder mysteries that remain ice cold and unsolved. The winter season signals a time of great joy and family gatherings for many. The time of year where we get to share the warmth of love and friendships and celebrate the holiday season. To some, however, winter means something much more dark, like succumbing to death's cold embrace. Here are five winter murder mysteries that remain ice cold and unsolved. Number five, Anthony and Albert Dawson. Life had really just begun for brothers Anthony and Albert Dawson. Both men from South Sacramento, California were still just in their 20s when the unexpected happened. On December 10th, 2002, Anthony and Albert were at their grandmother's house on Tam O'Shanter Way. They'd just come home after going out to buy some cigarettes for their grandma. It was already midnight, and the two decided to hang out just in front of the house, maybe to take a rest or perhaps to feel the cold December breeze. Twenty minutes later, though, the sound of multiple gunshots tore through the peaceful winter night. Everyone in the neighborhood scrambled outside to check what had happened. The brother's sister, Rashima Brazil, remembered rushing out from a friend's house. Grandma herself scuttled to see what happened in her own front yard. It was truly a horrible sight to behold, because on the ground lay the bodies of 24-year-old Albert and 22-year-old Anthony. The events that followed happened very quickly. When Brazil arrived at the scene, her brothers were already wrapped in white sheets. Sacramento police were considering the possibility that the killings were gang-related. The family of the victims believed otherwise, though. For them, the two were good men and would never allow themselves to get involved in such kind of activities. While that issue is yet to be clarified, investigators are still hoping to find any witnesses to the incident. And from the look of things, however, they probably aren't going to get one. Reports indicated that at the time of the shooting, it was only the brothers' grandmother's house that still had their Christmas lights on. Other than that, it was basically complete darkness on the isolated road that evening. Almost two decades have passed since the incident, and the police still can't figure out who shot the Dawson siblings on that cold December evening. Brazil revealed that their grandmother has passed away without even knowing the culprit or culprits who shot her grandkids. Most importantly, she would no longer be around should justice come down for the deaths of her two beloved. My grandmother died with a broken heart, Brazil said in an interview. The sister couldn't have said it any better. Her parents, even grandparents, the death of their children brings incomparable pain. But we can only imagine the agony they would feel if the ones responsible for the untimely passing of their children remained free and would never get to answer for their heinous deeds. Number four, Carol Rofsted. Depending on what country you're living in, the winter season signals a break from school. Students are most likely headed back home at the start of December. However, for some, like Carol Rosted, wintertime is just but another day of the work week. Rofsted, who was a student at Illinois State University, had stayed behind to work another shift at a local retail job. She did plan to go home to Elk Grove Village, but just for Christmas. Unfortunately, though, something occurred that would bring horror instead of joy to her family and loved ones that season. On December 23, 1975, the 21-year-old was found unconscious and badly beaten right in front of her sorority house. The subsequent medical examination revealed that she had sustained numerous injuries to the head. A possibility of sexual assault was also being considered. Meanwhile, detectives found a large railroad tie at the crime scene. Authorities believed this to be the primary murder weapon, considering that there was blood smeared all over it. 
Though the victim was already discovered in the early afternoon of December 23rd, the signs of hypothermia indicated that Rofsted had been outside all night long. She eventually died on Christmas Eve as a result of head injuries sustained from the blows. Initial investigations revealed that there were two men seen on the night of December 22nd. They were carrying a club of some sort. Witnesses described the suspects as being white males between the ages of 18 and 25. Many believe the incident to be isolated, but detectives from the normal police department thought otherwise. Back in the summer 1974, the victim was still living in the same sorority house with several other university students. There happened at that time to be a break-in wherein the windows were broken and their phone lines cut. The perpetrator reportedly found Rostad lying in her bed. The burglar allegedly went to the woman's bed, covered her mouth, and threatened to kill her. Rostad screamed, prompting the attacker to flee the scene, and ultimately he was never identified. Authorities were convinced that whoever assaulted the university student in 1974 was most likely the same person who left her for dead in 75. It's already been 46 years since the investigation began, but the police have yet to make a single arrest. Up to this day, no one knows who murdered the sorority girl. Her family and friends, however, remain hopeful that this cold case will one day be resolved. Number three, Ryan Riddle and Mark Praise. Statistically speaking, crimes like murder don't usually happen in small rural Midwest towns. And yet, it's hard to believe that one of the two people that we're going to feature in this story had twice become a victim of extreme violence. January 28, 2008. It was snowing heavily in Chrisman, Illinois. Two men, Ryan Riddle and Mark Praise, were spending the night at the latter's home. And this wouldn't be their first time hanging out together, considering that they had known each other for quite a long time already. Both 32-year-old men were fondly described as good guys with no apparent criminal history. Each respective family could not recall Riddle or Praise having enemies or someone they had a conflict with. However, on that cold night, the best friends were gunned down by unknown individuals. The victims were found the day after with multiple gunshot wounds. It was so disheartening, particularly for the Riddles, knowing that the man had been a victim of home invasion just seven months before the killing. This particular incident was part of a crime spree committed by two men from Chicago. In June of 2007, Yusuf Brown and William Thompson were being pursued by the state police when they ended up at Riddle's home in Villa Grove, Illinois. Brown and Thompson reportedly tied up the homeowner and left his house after stealing one of his cars. The pair, though, were eventually captured and then put on trial. There were a lot of speculation suggesting the connection between the 2007 home invasion and the 2008 double homicide. A spokesperson for the Illinois State Police, however, clarified that the two couldn't possibly be linked in any way. Authorities surmise that the first could purely be considered coincidental while the 2008 killings were deliberately planned. Investigators said Riddell and Praise were specifically targeted, considering that the house where it all happened is too difficult to find. Meaning, the killer or killers didn't just end up there randomly. With so many angles to consider, but few leads to work on, the riddle and praise double homicide remains to be one of the coldest and the most complicated cases the state authorities have ever had to deal with. Number two, Rachel Anthony. Rachel Anthony was a person that anyone would like to become when they grow up. A mother, a grandma, a hobby farmer, and an ardent advocate of animal rights, Anthony was also a woman of letters. She had penned countless literary pieces like poetry, short stories, and even a children's book. 
As a columnist, she also gave advice to readers for a local newspaper. One time, she talked about the importance of having a companion. This came forth following a string of rape incidents that happened in Pine River, Minnesota, and sadly, she wasn't able to take heed of her own advice. On the night of February 27, 2001, the 50-year-old was getting ready to finish up her shift at a local liquor store. It was freezing cold outside with temperatures hitting 19 below zero, and she was all by herself. At around 10, she was already starting to close up the place. As per her usual routine, she first went out to start up her car and heat up its interior. Afterwards, she went back inside to finally close the liquor store. By midnight, a roving police officer discovered Anthony's car idling with no one inside. He went to check the establishment and found the back door unlocked, and inside was the clerk's purse and coat. Nothing appeared to have been stolen, and no money was missing from the cash register as well. This baffled the detectives from the Cass County Sheriff's Office. They suspected that despite no signs of a struggle, the woman had probably been taken against her will that cold night. The ensuing investigation had the police rounding up all the possible customers that the missing woman served that night. Every single person cooperated and was eventually eliminated as a suspect, and a search operation was conducted as well, but that too ended up with nothing. On April 14, 2001, six weeks since she had vanished, four teenagers on horseback who happened to pass by Nelson Road near Breezy Point discovered a person's body abandoned in a ravine. It was later identified to be Rachel Anthony. The medical examiner determined asphyxiation to be the cause of her death. Homicide investigators suspected that the crime was committed by someone living near or having connections to the Pine River area. It's quite frustrating to know that since 2001, the sheriff's office, even with the help of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, still haven't had any clue as to what really happened on that winter night in February. For more than 20 years, the family, friends, and the community of Pine River, Minnesota, still believe that one day, they will get to know who did the horrible crime and get justice for the woman they so adored. Number 1. Angela Belial Vermont is without a doubt a lovely place where you get to discover old covered bridges, hike or climb its breathtaking mountains, or just stroll around its quaint and rustic towns. However, beyond its picturesque landscape and tourist places, the Green Mountain State also harbors some of the coldest homicide cases that continue to baffle law enforcement. On January 3rd, 1981, snow was still pouring all over Burlington when a student from the University of Vermont happened to pass by the residence of Angela Belial. At first glance, the witness thought that it was a mannequin that got toppled over the homeowner's driveway of 62 Brooks Avenue, but a second glance convinced the student that it was actually a human corpse. She then immediately called the police. During the initial investigation, authorities thought that the 35-year-old had gotten out of her car, slipped in the thick snow, and hit her head. This might have rendered her unconscious and, subsequently, she froze to death. But it didn't take long for this possibility to be ruled out. When they cleaned off and examined the body, the medical examiner found a gunshot wound. Then, a homicide investigation was immediately conducted. Evidence shows that the shooter had been waiting for the mother of three to arrive. Once she did, the perpetrator snuck up to her position and shot the target in the head. Police strongly believe that the shootout was perpetrated by someone who personally knew the victim, considering that he or she was aware of her routine. The fact that there were no valuables taken from the scene and even inside the house led authorities to further believe that the only goal here was to eliminate the woman. What makes the case even more difficult to crack was the lack of physical evidence that could tie someone to the crime. Despite a thorough search, 
Investigators could not locate the bullet that was supposed to be fired that day. Had they found the projectile, it could have been matched to a gun. Belial, who was a school teacher in St. Albans, had recently been divorced. On the night that she died, she had met with her ex-husband to drop off their children, and they were about to spend the night with their father. The man was among those first to be interrogated, but he was immediately let off the hook. Interestingly, an unnamed person was questioned during the initial investigation. That individual had then reportedly committed suicide shortly after being interviewed. Since the case was still officially active, investigators could not fully divulge the details of their work. However, one couldn't help but wonder if that person who killed himself or herself had anything to do with the merciless shooting. With him or her dead, Belial's death might forever remain a mystery. So there were five winter murder mysteries that remain ice cold and unsolved. Beautiful, yet chilling, enticing, but at the same time frightening. There's really something in the winter that makes it quite intriguing. For what is thought to be pleasant times, the cold can apparently bring out the most murderous of tendencies. If you liked that video, then check out some of these others on the right side of your screen. And if you aren't subscribed already, then get on it. Mm -hmm.